Hey guys, we're glad that you decided to join us for worship today. A couple of quick announcements for you to remind you about a few things that are going on. First off, our social media. Be sure you're liking and following us on social media through this time. That is one of the key ways that we communicate with everybody. So be sure you're following us on Instagram and Facebook and also subscribe to our YouTube page. A lot of good things going up there as well. Uh, also, our app. If you haven't downloaded our app, we would love for you to do that. It's got some great features to it for being able to find previous services, uh, prayer request function, online giving, calendaring. It's got a lot of really good things on it to help you stay connected with what we're doing. Just search FBC Okeechobee in the App Store. Also, giving. I want to say thank you to everyone that's continued to so faithfully um, give to our church and support our ministries through what has been a very unique and difficult time. I know it has been for so many of your families too, and I am from the bottom of my heart so appreciative for the faithfulness of so many of you guys. You are such a blessing to us um, to be a part of our church family with us. We love you guys and appreciate it so much. But a couple ways you can connect with us through giving. Number one is text. That's not something we talk about a lot, but that's an option as well, and it'll take you to our normal um, online giving um, platform that you can then use. Um, also through the app itself has a really easy online giving portal. That's my preferred way of giving. I, I, I use that the most. Then our website, you can also find a giving function there on our website. You can also drop those things off by the office. There's a mail slot there to the right side of the uh, office door that's checked daily. You can also mail those things in and the church's address you can find right on our website at fbcokey.org. So those are easy things for you to be able to connect with us there and thank you for that. Reopening. We are closing in, folks. On Sunday, May the 24th, we will be restarting our in-person services. Now, if at this time you don't feel comfortable yet coming to an in-person service, we totally understand. We appreciate that. And so all of our online um, things that we're doing are just going to continue right along for you. And you rejoin us in person once you feel comfortable and you feel safe. We're doing everything we can to um, make sure that we're meeting the guidelines that the, the state and our local officials have relayed to us and talked to us about doing. And we are following those to the very, very best of our ability. But we understand some people may not be totally comfortable yet. And we appreciate that understand that, and uh, we want you to do what you need to do for your family. We're here for you. We love you. We care about you, and we can't wait to the day when we see you back with us, but uh, you do what you need to do right now. But we hope that you have a blessed morning with us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and let's get started with worship today. Father, we thank you for the blessings that you have been to us, and God, how you have taken care of us through these things. So God, I pray you lead and guide our church, Lord, as we just seek to serve you and to be responsible in doing so. Uh, God, bless our community, our nation, our leaders, Lord. God, I thank you for the local leaders that we have that's been so responsive to us in, in talking with us about the things that we need to do. And God, I pray for our leaders on a state and national level, Lord, for wisdom for them as they, they strive to lead us. God, help them to set aside partisanship and to be men and women that are following your will. So God, this morning as we just worship you, Lord, God, I pray that everything that we do and everything that we say is for your glory and your honor because God, you are worthy of our praise. In your holy name we pray all these things. Amen. Enjoy worshiping with us today. Even when the fight calls, even when the wars win. 
storm weather my heart won't let the darkness beat me down sing in the night my hope alive in you and i'll walk through the fire and not be burned pray in the fight and watch it turn jesus tonight i give it all to you and i won't let the storm weather my heart won't let the darkness beat me down sing in the night my hope alive in you and i'll walk through the fire and not be burned pray in the fight and watch it turn jesus tonight i give it all to you
Hey, today as we continue our sermon series, Heavy Hitters, as we're digging into the lives of the men and women found in the Hall of Fame of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11, we come to what honestly for a lot of people is one of the most difficult in some ways passages of the Scripture that you'll find, and that's the story of Abraham taking Isaac to sacrifice him. It's a difficult story. I mean, you have a father and a son. Abraham ready to do what he was commanded. Isaac following along, carrying the wood, walking up the mountain. Abraham tying up his son, laying him on that altar and raising the knife to plunge it into his son to sacrifice him. You know, as I look at this, there's a lot of people that have a problem with this passage. And as a kid, I kind of understood. I got it. It's, It's difficult to understand why God did this. But the older I've gotten and the more I've studied Scripture and understood more of the character and the nature of God and the character and the nature of man, the more I've kind of come to understand where God was coming from. Look with me in verse 17. It says there, It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son Isaac. Now the problem that most people have with this is they feel like there's an issue with God's character in this. That He is asking Abraham to go and to sacrifice his son. How could he do this? There are critics that dismiss this as a a grotesque caricature of God. I don't think that's true at all. But on the flip side, and it's kind of related, but people will take a different stance with this. And what they do is they almost read the story backwards, which is a problem. They read the story from the point of view of, wait, we know that at the end of the story, God stops him. Abraham didn't know that. Abraham didn't know how this was all going to work out. He was, I believe, legitimately ready to plunge that knife into Isaac. He was legitimately ready to sacrifice him. This is what God told Abraham to do. And at that point, a person of faith has an option. You do it or you don't. It's not really an in-between. You do it or you don't. Look at verse 18. Even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Now, at this point, the writer of Hebrews chapter 11 wants us to understand something really important that this was really deep. We think about the incredible sorrow that someone would deal with with losing a child. But in this, there was even something else happening here. I mean, when I think about this, Abraham was ready to offer his son. He was prepared to do it. I mean... Verse 17 actually says he offered him. He was ready to really follow through with this. But the writer here wants us to dig past even that. Because see, God had already made a promise. All the way back in chapter 12 of Genesis. He said, I'm going to make you a great nation. Then he starts to get more detailed. I'm going to give you a son. Not just any son. A son from your wife Sarah. He waited 25 years for this. He was like 100 years old when Isaac was finally born. And God said, that's him. That's the son of promise. That's who is going to be the one that's going to make you into a great nation. This is the one that all your descendants will pass down through. This is the one that the Messiah will come through. This is the one that will show you how all the nation will be blessed. This is this child. And now here's God looking at him and saying, now sacrifice Let him go. That's a stunning 
request. See, what's happening here is Abraham is dealing with faith. At this moment, he was simply believing and trusting in God and he was leaving the how in the hands of of Almighty God. That's what he was doing. Because the promise that God had made to him over the course of those 25 years seemed to be contradicted by the command to sacrifice this child. Something wasn't working out. Something didn't add up. So if Abraham obeyed, does that cancel the promise? See, these are the things that, that, that you stop and you dig into and you think about. And he didn't know how God would work this out. He just knew God would work this out. So he's leaving that how in God's hands. And sometimes we spend so much time trying to figure out how God is going to take care of something instead of trusting Him to take care of it. Instead of trusting Him with the situations in our lives, we try to analyze how God will deal with it. And I'll tell you something. I have been so guilty of this over the years. But almost every time, God has surprised me when I've gone through those difficult moments. I've gone through some of that testing and those trials myself of how He brings me through it. It's never exactly how I expected for it to happen. And see, so as you, as you read this story, as you, as you ponder over this, always remember you can't read that story backwards. Abraham was trusting God with the how. He was ready to go forward. He didn't have the whole story. He only had his little bit piece. He didn't know how this was going to turn out any more than you know how it's going to turn out when you get in a car to go on a trip, when you go to work, when you go to the grocery store. We go to the doctor's office. We don't know how. We don't know what's coming. And that's how Abraham was. He only saw what was right in front of him. He couldn't see way down the road. He didn't understand all these things that are coming. And we're not called to simply try to always figure out this big picture. See, we like to see that, and I like to see that. I like that big picture. I want to know what's coming. I want to plan. I want to see it all. The big picture is God's. And what I struggle with sometimes is that I have to simply stop and say, okay, God, I'm going to do my little part over here. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to do what I think is your will to the best of my ability, and I'm going to leave that big picture to you. That's hard to do, but it's also... It's freeing. When you get to that place, it lifts a weight off of your shoulders. That you don't feel like you're trying to carry these things. That you understand there's somebody bigger and better than you that is carrying those things out and he sees the big picture. Abraham was trusting in that. Look at verse 19. This is, this is brought even into more focus. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense... Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. Now, when you go to this account that that you find in Genesis 22, that's that's a much more detailed account of this, this time that we're talking about today in just a few verses, kind of summarized in Hebrews chapter 11. Abraham hinted several times at the fact that he thought Isaac would be brought back, that he would live. He hints at this. In Genesis 22, verse 5, here's what he says. He says, Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little further. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. Notice that we. He didn't say, we will travel there, we will worship, I will come back. There was no eyes, it was all we's. Like, he had plans to bring this boy back with him. And even as the two of them walked, Isaac is carrying the wood. Isaac was a little bit older here. We think Isaac was probably 13, 14, 15 years old when this was taking place. He says, Father, where's the, where's the, where's the ram for the burnt offering? And Abraham simply says, God will provide. He was trusting in this. See, he believed that God could raise the dead. He had never seen it. He had never experienced it. 
He was 2,000 years from Christ. There are some other instances in Scripture later on in the Old Testament of, of, of people being raised from the dead. Abraham had never seen this. But yet somehow here he is believing this. See, he was wrong about Isaac dying that day. He didn't die because of the last second Abraham was told to stop. But he believed that if God had made this promise about this child, and this is what God's called me to do, He'll give it back to me. He'll take care of this. That's the incredible part of his faith. See, this is Abraham's faith at its highest and its finest point. And now we can kind of stand back and we can look at the story with some perspective. Did God ask him to sacrifice his son? Yes. Then it comes in, was it a legitimate request? Yes, it was. He really wanted Abraham to go down this road. And he knew Abraham didn't know how it would end. This was a test of Abraham's faith, but it was also a test that Abraham was going through that would then show God's faithfulness. So not only was Abraham's faith being tested here, God's faithfulness was being shown. That the promises that had been made to Abraham would be carried out. And that Abraham and Isaac could trust God for these things. He knew what God asked him to do. He knew what it meant. And he was willing to follow through. That's its highest and best point of faith. The command might not have made any sense from a human perspective, but here he is following through anyway. And you know, an incredible part of this is that for all of these thousands of years, Christians have looked back on this story and we see Christ. You know, in this, in this story, we see kind of a forerunner of Christ and the Father. God the Father and God the Son. The Father sacrificing His Son in this moment. You see, in Genesis 22, we see what a man would do for the love of God. But in the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, we see what God would do for the love of man. See, Abraham was only asked to sacrifice Isaac. The Father followed through. He did sacrifice Christ. He did give him up. There was no ram in the thicket to offer in his place. So the Father's hand fell in judgment on the Son. and Christ died for us. It's a beautiful picture that you find here in Hebrews 11 and in Genesis 22 that foreshadows what would happen. So when I think about this story, what am I supposed to take away from this? When I, when I read through Genesis 22, I'm struck by something that God said to Abraham after this. In verse 12 of Genesis 22, He says, You have not withheld from Me even your son, your only son. Your only son. You haven't held anything back from Me. See, what God is saying right here, I asked you for the most precious thing in the world to you and you were willing to give it. Because Isaac was the most precious thing in the world to him. He was everything to him. See, here's this man that had waited all of those years for this child. He desperately wanted. He wanted to see this promise fulfilled and he desperately wanted this son to raise. And God said, give him back. And Abraham was willing. So the text is simply trying to explain what it takes a lifetime to learn that at moments, God wants our best. He wants what's dearest to us. In one of his books, Watchman Nee talks about this. If you've never heard of Watchman Nee, I encourage you to, to, to look him up. He was a great Chinese pastor. Loved the Lord. And eventually died under communist persecution in China. He was killed by the Communist Party of China for his faith. This is what he said in one of his books. He said, 
We approach God like little children with open hands, begging for gifts because He is a good God. He fills our hands with good things. Life, health, friends, money, success, recognition, challenge, marriage, children, a nice home, a good job. All the things we count at Thanksgiving when we count our blessings. And so like children, we rejoice in what we have received and run around comparing what we have with each other. And when our hands are finally full, God says, My child, I long to have fellowship with you. Reach out your hand and take my hand. But we can't because... Our hands are full. God, we can't, we cry. Put those things aside and take my hand. No, we can't. It's too hard to put them down. But I'm the one who gave them to you in the first place, says God. Oh God, what you have asked is too hard. Please don't ask us to put these things aside. And God answers quietly, you must. You see, one of the things that we get from this passage is the idea of idols. See, idols are not just gold and silver statues that people bow down to and worship. We think that's weird, right? That's not something that... That would be strange. But we all have idols in our lives. And the process of Christian growth is about breaking down those idols. It's about letting go of those things. See, a lot of times the idols in our lives are not bad things inherently they're, they're, they're good things. Isaac was a good thing. He was the child of promise. His father loved him dearly. And yet God still said, let him go. Now I don't think God's going to call, call us to sacrifice our children. But God does call us to put everything in proper perspective and in proper organization within our lives, in proper scale. You see, when we have things that we worship, relationships that we worship, we have idols. We make idols out of sports. We make idols out of our jobs. We make idols out of our children, out of our spouses, our families, our money, our houses, our cars. None of those things in themselves are bad. But when they take the preeminent place in our life ahead of our God, they become an idol and they themselves become sin. Isaac was so important to Abraham that God wanted him to understand that even Isaac himself could never come before a fellowship and obedience to the God that gave him Isaac. Isaac was a blessing from God. And we can't worship the thing God gave us above him. But in our culture, we so many times become so enamored with all of these things and these people and this success and these accolades that they become what we worship, even for Christians. We lose ourselves in these things. And we put more emphasis on the travel ball team or our job or our possessions or the boat or going to the lake or all these other things, than we do on the actual worship and on the actual service to God. Those things become preeminent. Your spouse can be an idol. Your family can be an idol. Your children, your money, your ministry, your career. It all can be an idol if you don't keep it in the proper perspective. Nothing wrong with any of those things or having those things. But always keeping them right. That's the challenge of the story. See, Abraham had to come to the place where he was willing to give back to God what God had given to him. And it's not that God was even going to ask for it. It's not that God was even really going to take it. But it was about being dedicated to the obedience to God above all else. See, I think sometimes we minimize what it means to be a follower of Christ. We make it a little part of our lives. It's a little compartment over here. It's like a room in your house, right? You've got rooms in your house dedicated to certain things. You have a bathroom. You have a kitchen. You have a dining room, a living room. You have bedrooms. You have a home office. See, our relationship with Christ becomes like one of those rooms. It's it's there. It's a part of our life. It has a specific purpose. And it's got its place. Your, Your relationship with Christ, your relationship with God is not about 
a place within your house or a place within your life or a certain section of your life. Your relationship with God encompasses all of your life. Every other good thing you have comes from Him. It's all His. So we stop and we think about it that way. Our relationship with God and our dedication to Him streams across every part of our lives. It's not just in one part. It's not in a room. It's not compartmentalized. It's throughout all of it. And in this story, see, I think at the end of the day, we see God's kindness on display. That when we're trying to hold on to so many things we value so much, God's looking at us saying, will you let it go? Don't hang on to it so tight. Understand where it comes from. Understand whose it is at the end of the day. And put it in its proper perspective. The thing we should be holding on tight to is not the things of this world. It's the things of God. Because that's what lasts. That's that eternal part. That's what's happening. And as we go through life, God slowly weans us off of these things. I found that, that He's changed my perspective on things over the years. He's slowly changed me. It's not anything I've done. It's what He's done in me. I praise Him and thank Him for it. That He's made things that used to be so important secondary. I can still enjoy them. They're still a part of my life. They're in proper perspective. So as you think about this story, what in your life is so precious to you that if God said, give it to me, you wouldn't. You couldn't bear to open your hands and let go. You'd be like that kid that says, I, I, can't, I can't open my hands, I can't put it down. i got to hold on to it. Like a kid holding on to a toy on Christmas morning. That's the idol. And that's the thing you've got to open your hand and be willing to let go. Be willing to say, okay, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it in the right perspective. And God may choose to take it from you. God may say, I'm going to move this out of your life. Or maybe He leaves it right there with you. But says, keep it as it should be. See, God above all else. Because we can keep the world for a moment, or we can keep God for eternity. That's our options. That's our choices. So over the course of this week, what I want you to think about is, what is your Isaac? What is the thing you hold on to so tightly? And are you willing to lay it down for Jesus Christ? Pray with me. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity we've had to study your word, to look at one of the, the seminal stories in all of Scripture. God, I pray you help us to be like Abraham in this. Lord, to be willing to let go of even the most precious things to us. God, bless us. Lord, help us to open our hands and to put you above all else in the service of you above all else. Thank you, God, for all you do. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for worshiping with us today. We look forward to seeing you soon. Be blessed.